Welcome. We are here today with Professor Jorge Diaz Cintas, Professor of Translation Studies at University College London. Welcome and thank you for having us today. Thank you very much for having invited me. Professor Diaz Cintas, for the last 15 years, what have been the main changes in audiovisual translation as a discipline and as a titling in particular? <laughs> Uh, well, we've been living uh, really special times um, with the uh, evolution in technology and particularly with the change that switched over from analog to digital technology. Uh, we saw a vast increase in the production of uh, translation, both for uh, dubbing but also for subtitling. And uh, most importantly, perhaps, was also the wider visibility of new disciplines like uh, subtitling for the deaf and hard of hearing and audio description which started to be to, to become much more common in in the audiovisual landscape uh, within the field we have seen uh, a move from linguistic analysis uh, even cultural analysis to take a to take a more uh, concrete view on aspects like, for instance, uh, fan subbing, amateur practices, uh, reception of audiovisual uh, products. Uh, traditionally, we assumed what uh, viewers will be thinking uh, when watching a program, but now we've got biometric uh, tools that will allow or we start uh, being able to guess and to find out a bit more in detail. Uh, how people are actually behaving when they are reading text on, on, on the screen. Um, so there's been quite a, a big change in the evolution uh, in, in that sense. Um, also in the profession, you know, workflows have changed uh, dramatically. Um, starting as we did a few years back with uh, freeware for subtitling or programs that were much cheaper than had been traditionally to now being at that sort of moment where we feel that uh, subtitling software will be disappearing gradually and it will be much more an activity that it will be done on the cloud rather than on your own computer. So that's also having a big impact on how the industry is developing, on how the industry is considering how to deal with programs and, and how to reach new audiences in the world. In your inaugural lecture a week ago, you also mentioned that subtitling could be studied from the point of view of policy and activism. Could you expand on that? Uh, well, you know, it, it's been uh, for a long time now, you know, the late 90s, uh, that uh, this uh, democratization of technology made it possible for people to take part in uh, activities, uh, to be active consumers or active participants rather than just passive. Uh, participants in the consumption of audiovisual, audiovisual material. Um, so what we are finding now these days um, in, in the, uh, on the internet is uh, collectives of people that are interested in certain areas um, and they just uh, participate together to give visibility to those areas. It started with, for instance, the subtitling of anime, fan subbing, um, a Japanese anime that were then distributed to other cultures and other countries where that material wasn't really available. Uh, then he moved on to uh, TV series and these days, you know, companies have to be very careful not to get their programs hacked and then distributed before their actual distribution is going to take place uh, uh, globally. And, uh, and then different other areas where people are, are pulling their strengths together and their forces together to reach some sort of, um, to enact some sort of power. Now, in my uh, professorial uh, inaugural, I was very interested in the new developments that we've seen in activism and politics, uh, using subtitling as a tool to reach other uh, audiences, uh, other countries, uh, to just make your uh, ideas, your policy, your political agendas uh, much more, uh, uh, you know, with a wider reach. Now, uh, you know, I did it as well because it coincided with a rather turbulent period in, 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 in British politics. We are still uh, suffering from the last elections which just happened a couple of weeks ago. And it's been quite a lot of information on the newspapers, for instance, that uh, the increase of the 
uh, Labour Party was mainly due to the use of social uh, networks. And, and that's what I was looking at from the perspective of subtitling. So we do have lots of um, uh, groups. Uh, for instance, I was looking at several ones from different countries, AG+, which is more Arab world, uh, then uh, Spanish Revolution, uh, which as the name says is more uh, based in Spain, and then also a French group called Jean Doute, and see what they were doing, how they were doing it, and how they were using subtitles in many uh, diverse ways. Uh, some of them were pretty traditional in their format and in the way they were um, presenting the information on the screen. Some others are much more creative and they play with the positioning of the subtitles with including information to explain and elaborate further on cultural references that might be a bit cryptic. And I was also interested, uh, and I am interested, in looking at what I call fake subs which are subtitles that you know from the very beginning that they cannot be real, that they are not represented with the person uh, is saying on the screen, but that are used in a very sarcastic, ironic way to produce laughter and somehow uh, um, propel people into action. Um, and there's a little bit of research being done, this what is called laughtivism, just using laughter as a way of activism in politics. And then I was showing a few clips on, on how this is done. There's a very famous one, which is uh, a German film called uh, The Unterfall, uh, Downfall. And that's been one of the scenes where Hitler appears. It's been manipulated, remediated, redistributed uh, for many different purposes, always by, the, by means of subtitle. So that was another area that I, I wanted to explore. So there is a connection between audiovisual media and reception of information, obviously, as you have mentioned in the case of fake news, but also an educational side to it, formally and informally. Yeah, uh, we have seen a lot of uh, developments in the way how we teach and we approach the visual translation and from different angles. Uh, traditionally, and that's what I belong to, it was making sure that the visual translation was going to be much more visible, much more prominent, in academic curricula and um, still many countries I, I receive requests for colleagues in countries as far as I feel as Russia, uh, Vietnam, Indonesia where they are struggling to prepare people in these areas they can see the potential uh, in the industry but still the, the, the universities are very slow so that's always been one of my main areas of, uh, of, of activity in making sure there is more visibility and that audiovisual translation is an integral part of any curriculum in, in academia that is uh, uh, developed and designed to train our future translators. But what we're also finding now is another novel use of subtitling for instance but also dubbing audio description uh, which is in language, in foreign language learning and teaching people using strategies, using the activities that you would normally do for the industry, not to train people to become professionals in those areas, but just simply to make sure that they will enjoy the activities, that they will be much more uh, immersed in the, in the activity that they're doing, with the benefits and the plus that they will be uh, working with transferable skills, with media programs, with video producers, uh, video players, uh, uh, subtitling software, uh, translating, changing their translation, recording their voices, and so on. So, and that is another area that has grown exponentially in, in, in not many years. Um, and that is uh, another uh, point of inflection in the way things are changing in our field. In the era of um, robotization and automatization with the use of technology, uh, to put it bluntly, what is a translator useful for? <laughs> uh, I, I think we are still very, very useful uh, to many things and we should be, for instance, much more uh, involved in that process of robotization and automation, which is something that, uh, as translators, we seem to be always at the end, uh, at the end of a book, at the end of an audiovisual program, uh, post-production areas, and we seem to ignore, to, we don't want to get involved in the previous stages, and I think that's always, good, that's always been an issue, and it's clearly becoming a problem these days when you get lots of uh, program software platforms that are developed uh, to do subtitling, for instance, which is the area 
that I know best. And when you talk to subtitlers, they are really unhappy with some of the changes because they don't really help them uh, with their jobs. Uh, but equally, they're not willing to help in the initiative, uh, in the initial stages, to just give feedback about that wouldn't work, why don't you do it this way, the other way, and blah blah. So I think we need to strengthen dialogue with manufa manufacturers, uh, developers, and also people doing the translation. The translation. Um, translation has always been involved with technology in all areas, uh, but probably most crucially in audiovisual translation. We only have audiovisual translation because the invention of the cinema. And that's why it's always been lots of things going on, technologically speaking. And, and I think that's why sometimes it feels that you know everything can be done automat automatically. In, in audiovisual translation, you can just get a video and a machine can listen to what the person is saying and then you can get uh, subtitles on the screen, which can be gibberish most of the time. Uh, you also find uh, you know, uh, subtitling programs that will read the images to tell you whether there are any short changes, whether people are speaking or are not speaking, so that you just go and spot uh, and do your queuing uh, in particular areas. So there is a lot of automation um, that is uh, helping and sometimes not so helpful uh, for, uh, for um, professionals, but I, I still think that there is uh, uh, you know, the figure of the translation. The translator would always be uh, around. And, and you know, I don't see it happening anytime soon that machine will just take over from subtitlers or other translators to produce translations, to produce outputs that will be of communicative validity. Uh, finally, what would you say are the fundamental skills for a translator today? Uh, I think, as, as we were saying, you know, technology is a uh, sine qua non uh, for any translator and uh, you know being conversant with all sorts of uh, technologies uh, will be very very important and it's very very important and also having a sort of um, disposition to fully understand what you are doing but also to realize or to forecast what the potential can be in the future and see how you can then help other people uh, and developers to, to come up with new uh, functions or new uh, programs that will be, um, uh, you know, fruitful and, and, and operative for, for translators. And, and that's something that, uh, surprisingly, you still don't find. You know, we, we teach a program which is an MSc, it's not an MA, uh, which heavily drones on technology, and then you still find some students that are a little bit reluctant to uh, embrace technology beyond the user's uh, faci uh, functionality to, to know a bit more and to, to be able to play better with what is available there. Um, so, you know, quite a bit of work to be done in that area. And of course, you know, you need to know you, uh, the languages that you're working with. That's, you know, uh, a, a, a necessary uh, element of your work. Uh, the way the profession is developing, one needs to be also a good marketeer and you need to know how to sell your services. And this is something that I feel we still don't do to the best of our abilities in many programs. And you find many students or many recently graduated professionals that struggle to know how to position themselves in the industry out there, uh, how to sell their services. Uh, they, you know, they, they hope to be part of a company or they have to, they hope to be in-house uh, employers, employees. Uh, but, you know, the way we're seeing the development is that, you know, more and more freelancing is taking uh, a, a, a firm control of how things are uh, developing or how uh, people are working in the future, are, are working and will be working in the future. And I think we need to be able as well to, to tap into that, to, to do this business approach to, to your own work. Professor Jorge Diaz Fintas, thank you very much. Thank you very much.